context of technology. I did name it Walking in Your Shoes. That's the like more fancy title for it. Thinking about how I can speak about how this generation thinks of technology, especially as it relates to education. Um, but here are some points basically from the keynote to explore, which is feeling purpose in learning, that it can be expressed through autonomous learning, and that student voice can be expressed through advocacy and activism. So to start off with, how do we create purpose? When I think about purpose in education, I again think back to my early days, and I think of how much I write. So I have a blog that I try to update semi-frequently. Unfortunately, as high school gets more stressful, I update the blog less. I honestly wish that it were the reverse, where I would be as interested in the subjects and everything that I was learning that I would feel the need to update this blog all the time. My last one is actually from August, which reminds me that I should make a new post. And actually, with your help, I would love to write new posts about some of the things that we decide are uh, interesting techniques or methods that you might use in the classroom. Um, so I'll log in and we can work on that. And so I've actually been blogging for a very long time. Uh, over here, if you scroll down, then you can see as far as where um, let's see, uh, blog archive. It goes all the way back to 2005. And my blogs were a little shorter then and probably a little less well written, but I had one called Hello Everybody, <laughs> not the best title. But even back in 2005, I had an acute awareness of this idea that I had to produce something that was worth hearing or worth reading for my audience. That I wasn't just going to go and say, yo, what's up, and leave it at that, <laughs> because nobody would really enjoy reading that. And so a blog was my first exposure to the idea that we don't just write for ourselves, that we do write for an audience sometimes, and that there are things that you want to make sure you do. Have correct grammar, have correct spelling, have correct punctuation. Because if you have something that you want to say to the world, you want to make sure that there's no way it could possibly under be a misunderstood and that it's something you can be proud of. Having an understanding of that concept is something that takes a lot of students a while to grasp because there aren't a whole lot of opportunities to have writing shared out to a larger audience. A blog was an amazing way for me to have that opportunity. And there are a lot of actually elementary school students, middle school students who, they might seem young to have a blog, but they do. And it would be amazing if they could have blogs within more of an educational context so that they really learn how to approach not only an audience of peers, but also an audience of teachers, an audience of parents. I think that that could have tremendous value. So writing taught me a lot about how to get my messages out and how to show what I was interested in. I also posted poems, excerpts from different uh, books that I was reading in 2006. Let me go through see if I uh, started writing some. I began writing this uh, blog called Become an Expert, and my topic was ancient China. And because I was really interested in this topic, I do research, I try to find primary and secondary sources, and I would just post whatever I learned on the blog. So it's a very simple kind of prompt. It doesn't require a whole lot. It wasn't driven by a link or primary or anything. And that's something that many students could tackle really easily. Just ask them, what are you interested in? What's the subject you'd like to research more? Now write blogs about it. Make it interesting that you're a little brother or sister. Make it interesting to your parents. Make it interesting to me. And so writing is definitely how I would start um, saying we can use collaborative technology very easily. Another thing is um, writing with students, creating stories together. This is one of my favorite things to do whenever I present to a group of elementary school students is to author a story together. So put on your seven, eight, and nine-year-old hats for a moment. And let's write a story. This is a Google document, so uh, what should we write a story about? Someone throw it out. About a boy. About a butterfly. A butterfly. <laughs> you can't click a seven year old. <laughs> about a butterfly. A butterfly. Oh, perfect. Okay. Okay. Oops, I can't spell butterfly apparently. I actually once misspelled beautiful in front of a group of fifth graders from New York. They laughed at me and <laughs> told me how to spell it correctly and we proceeded. That was actually like my personal learning from failure moment. I knew how to spell it, but I was way too obsessed with the idea of like, I can't fail in front of students. And yeah, so I learned from that. But okay, butterfly. How do we describe the butterfly? So maybe we need to introduce the setting. As I walked into the garden is a little cliche. We see butterflies in gardens all the time. So what is a completely wacky place to see a butterfly? As I walked into the classroom, great, I did a double take. What was that over, what was that fluttering over in the corner? Make a bigger phone. 
Oh, yeah. Surely someone hadn't, surely a piece of paper couldn't stay up in the air for so many seconds. It took me a moment, gaping stupidly, and then I realized it was a butterfly. I will spell that correctly on my first one. A butterfly? So how do we describe this character's reaction? Obviously, we have like some surprise here, but what else? What are some other feelings? He's wondering so oddly what the butterfly student in the classroom setting. Okay. How do you do that? What? I had turned immediately to my friend's cool name. Hopefully, their name is not actually cool name. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Zane. Zane. Like this? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a very cool name, and demanded, what's the butterfly doing in here? How did it get here? Are we supposed... He cut me off. Don't ask so many questions. What is the name of our character? Aliana. Sorry? Aliana. Aliana? Mm -hmm. How do I spell that? A-L-A-N-A. -A -A Awesome. That is a cool name. I've never. Wow. That's so many questions, Aliana. We'll find out. Give it some time. I didn't much trust Zane's words, considering the last time he told me, "Give it some time." I. Uh, what is a bad thing that could happen from giving something time? Some time. An instance where Zane's words were very untrue, or. You melted. Perfect. My house had um, a bowl of popcorn had caught, had <laughs> been incinerated in my microwave. I feel like there's a, how can we phrase that better? Combusted? Hmm. I could use a different word, but maybe also had been incinerated. I feel like that's a little bit clunky. Maybe, um, since last time he told me, give it some time. Just in time, we can say a bull is A bull? What about the smell of it? Mm -hmm. The smell of the mm -hmm. <laughs> With the memories, memories of, uh, popcorn, Memories of the smell of burnt popcorn still rank in my nostrils. <laughs> I scowled at Zane and said, But I want to know now. So, how does Aliana find out? Started, started dashing toward the butterfly in the corner of the room. Wait, Zane called. I stopped. You'll scare it if you run. So, we can probably stop here, but let's read it out loud. As I walked into the classroom, I did a double take. What was that fluttering over in the corner? Surely a piece of paper couldn't stay up in the air for so many seconds. It took me a moment, gazing stupidly, and then I realized it was a butterfly. A butterfly? I turned immediately to my friend Zane and demanded, What's the butterfly doing in here? How'd it get here? Are we supposed to? He cut me off. Don't ask so many questions, Aliana. We'll find out. Give it some time. 
I didn't much trust Zane's words, considering the last time he told me to give it some time, a bowl of popcorn had incinerated. With the memories of the smell of burnt popcorn still rank in my nostrils, I scowled at Zane and said, but I want to know now. Having made up my mind, I clambered out of my seat and started dashing toward the butterfly in the corner of the room. Wait, Zane called. I stopped. You'll scare it if you run. Why did Zane have to be right sometimes, I thought, frustrated. Letting out a massive sigh, I started tiptoeing with exaggerated care toward the butterfly, still fluttering in the corner. So this is where it ends. Now what I could do is hit share. And then if students had access to email, then I could send it to them and they could edit it, or I could simply post a link and they wouldn't even need the, um, actually, yeah, maybe you'd need the email to log into Google Docs, but I think that uh, you can post the link to share and make it accessible to collaborators and then anybody can edit it once they have that link. So I could say, for instance, one group of students edit it tomorrow, another group of students edit it the day after that, and what you could create is this interesting chain story as people go in and they really make it their own section by section. So that's one of the nice things about Google Docs, you can collaborate, anyone can edit it once you give them the link or you send it to them via email. And uh, of course, not all young students might have the typing skills, so you could also do the typing up for them in the classroom to get the story started or to finish it off. And I really love working with students who produce stories. I ask them sometimes for specific lines, or um, we might brainstorm all the characters in the setting ahead of time so that we have a bit more of a plan. But it really allows the students to see that writing is something that you can just really go for and you can edit as you go, that it doesn't need to be this very laborious, drawn out process where you sit and you look at a blank page and the cursor blinking and you cry and then you write a word and then you delete the word, which is honestly how a lot of people start because they're so preoccupied with this notion that writing has to be hard and arduous and in this case it really wasn't. It was pretty pain free, almost as much as um, just watching a butterfly. So. Writing provides one of the greatest ways for students to have an impact, especially when that writing is social, when it's on a blog, or when it's somewhere that other students can read it, um, such as a Google Doc that is being edited collaboratively. So the second thing would be to do good. And this is the, <laughs> this is the petition that I mentioned, uh, Let the Laura See for the Trees, and it was presented by the Park School Paper Club. They're a fourth grade class. And this is how they described it. So this is what the teacher wrote. Couldn't be more proud of my fourth graders. They rallied 57,000 of you who knew the meaning of unless. They made, a, they made posters, wrote a script in the style of Seuss, and shot a video. They've been reaching out to everyone they know, lighting a fire under this cause, then graphing your signature count to track the progress of their project. So fourth graders getting so into it that they voluntarily graph a signature count I mean, I'm an AP stats. So we do not voluntarily grasp this. <laughs> uh, so these fourth graders are pretty advanced, and they really did so much in order to make this possible. It was a victory, 57,000 supporters as well. And I know this really goes to show what can happen when you give students the opportunity to have a platform on which they can speak about something they care about. So if you introduce your students to change.org, they will see how easy it is to start a petition. petition. You make a video or you write up a post about here's something I care about and here's what should be changed about it. So it could be something local, like uh, getting a sidewalk paved or having a park restored or something like that, um, having litter cleaned up, starting a maybe community day for play or a community day for raising awareness about something important. And then you can choose the number of supporters that you want to have. For a local issue, maybe you want to get 300, 500, 1,000 supporters. For a big national or a global issue, you might reach really high for 60,000 supporters, even 100,000. So starting small can be a great way for students to see, wow, I have a dream, I can make it happen. So uh, ch using change order is a really good one. Another great one is called Piggybacker. And this is a funding platform for young people, so it's basically Kickstarter for elementary schoolers or middle school and high schoolers as well. I'm trying to use it for my speech and debate team, and it's really easy, and it's also designed so that students are learning from the process. That it isn't just about students raising money, that it's very much earning badges, uh, learning how to write good emails to possible donors, and how to give good rewards. So for instance, you can if someone gives $200, you might reward them with a t-shirt. Or if somebody gives $50, you might reward them with a hand-drawn and written thank you card. Whatever it might be. It really teaches students how to create good rewards, how to write good emails, how to be effective, succinct, and use social media appropriately. So there are a bunch of um, different examples. Some are independent ones. 
there are choruses, or sorry, choirs, robotics competitions, um, individuals who want to start, um, who want to visit capitals. Uh, yeah, so lots of different examples. And uh, let's see, if I hit browse projects, we can take a look at some. You'll see that they're mostly very young students, 12 and under even. If it loads. <laughs> building an app for businesses. This kid is 11 years old and he's building an app. I mean, that's better than what I was doing at 11. Save the street, um, children's programming, children nine through 13 to perform in New York City, 16 year old who wants to uh, help nonprofit, Mrs. Piero, seventh graders raising money for the World Wildlife Fund, donating money to save a wombat. <laughs> so these are some incredibly awesome projects. They range from supporting sports teams, to supporting choirs, to supporting building an app, individuals, groups, all kinds. So that's an example of Piggy Backer. And I want to show a little bit of a quick video. Who here has seen Kiran Mirsefi's TED Talk? Yeah? Okay, so uh, this should be pretty fun. <laughs> H1N1, I like the word. Laughter is contagious, passion is contagious, inspiration is contagious. We have heard some remarkable stories from some remarkable speakers. But for me, what was contagious about all of them was that they were infected by something I call the I can bug. So the question is, why only them? In a country of a billion people and some, why so few? Is it luck? is a chance, can we all not systematically and consciously get infected? So in the next eight minutes, I would like to share with you my story. I got infected when I was 17, when as a student of the design college, I encountered adults who actually believed in my ideas, challenged me, and had lots of cups of chai with me. And I was struck by just how wonderful it felt and how contagious that feeling was. I also realized I should have got infected when I was seven. So when I started Riverside School 10 years ago, it became a lab, uh, a lab to prototype and refine a design process that could consciously and 